I'd love to welcome Raya Hansel to the stage. Um, for, the, for those of you who don't know her, she's a research scientist at DeepMind, um, focusing on topics in lifelong learning, uh, deep reinforcement learning and robotics. Uh, she previously spent time at SRI International at CMU. So with that, Raya, here's your clicker. Great. Thanks. Hey, clicker. No podium, but I get a clicker. <laughs> Good enough. Um, great. Thank you for having me. Um, and uh, did not have far to go, so we're just a couple floors down. Um, in this lovely building. And uh, the work that I do there, I've been working for the last three years or so with DeepMind. And I work in the area of deep reinforcement learning. And specifically, I've started to spend a lot of my time thinking about how we can take some of the research that we've done, uh, amazing research in areas like Atari games, uh, the very important world of Atari games or uh, professional Go playing, and bring that towards more real-world problems. Uh, but that, of course, is, is a challenge. Uh, and, and in particular, my background is in deep learning and robotics. And I would love it if we could bring the uh, potential of deep reinforcement learning all the way to the area of, of robotics um, and be able to train robots in the same way that we can train um, uh, Atari agents, for instance. So let me start off by giving us all a little bit of a reminder as to uh, uh, a, a, a little history on how we got to uh, where we are now with a lot of people, a lot of technologists, all thinking about deep learning and artificial intelligence. Um, so a few examples, a, a quick timeline. So in 2010, um, I'd say that the state-of-the-art method for taking an audio stream and turning it into text, i.e. doing speech recognition, was to train an acoustic model, train a phoneme model, train a language model, put these together, um, do some more tuning maybe, and that was our state of the art for doing um, audio to text speech recognition. And then uh, deep networks came and made things better by simply taking one model and training it basically end to end, from the end output that we want all the way back to the, um, to the raw inputs. Uh, a couple years later, this was closer to my heart because I've always done more work in the domain of computer vision. Um, so the, the sort of state-of-the-art methods involve taking raw pixel inputs, extracting key points, um, uh, doing uh, feature uh, computations, maybe applying something like a deformable part model before ending at the result that you might want in this area, maybe labels for uh, objects in the image. And of course, with ImageNet all of a sudden and AlexNet, we ended up with uh, a new competitor in the area, which was DeepNets, which uh, uh, surpassed the old results by uh, double digits in terms of percentage points in accuracy. Um, Machine translation, much the same thing happened. There was, I think, more, more resistance here because the feeling was that we needed to have all of the expertise, the domain knowledge that went into this field that allowed you to do text-to-text -text machine translation. Um, but again, with the enough data, big enough uh, models, the right sort of learning, then we end-to-end -end learning ended up changing uh, this field and allowing a better level uh, more accurate machine translation more automatically than had been previously been possible. That brings us to what I would point to as being something that looks a little bit similar, which is uh, the, the sort of state of the art of how robotics is done, which is that you start with some raw sensors in the world on a robot. Uh, you have a perception module, you have uh, maybe a, a, a map or a world model, um, you have some planning, you have some control. Um, and then you have the output, which is the actual action to take. So this looks a little bit too similar. <laughs> I think that uh, it is perhaps a matter of time only before we find that in, act in interactive environments um, that we start to see end-to-end -end trained neural networks uh, doing better than this previous state of the art. But robotics is different, right? So if we want to uh, train a big network to predict labels from images, then we can have, we have big data sets. We have t been speakers today talking about, about wonderful data sets um, that we can collect. Uh, but for robotics, the problem is, is that the robot changes the world as it takes actions. So you can't take a static data set and simply learn actions from it. Um, you really have to have uh, a interactive 
domain, an interactive learning domain, where there's uh, a feed from sensors and where the actions can have the possibility of changing what comes from those sensors in the world. That's a fundamentally different way to do machine learning than taking a, a data set and drawing IAD batches from it and training a uh, big neural network with lots of optimization approaches. So um, that brings us to reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is one of the ways, one of the best ways that we know how to uh, learn uh, to produce actions from an interactive uh, Inter interactions with an environment. Um, so just to run through this cartoon, we think of reinforcement learning as being a, a relationship between an agent, which can take actions, um, and an environment, which produces observations. Um, the agent is given a goal, and there are observations which come from this environment um, uh, to, to the agent. For instance, a, a, an image, a video, um, touch sensors, um, some sort of input information, and there's actions that the agent can take that could change that environment. Um, and there's a reward signal. And, and this, is, this is the puzzle. This is how we uh, would like to be able to learn in more uh, in, 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 in interactive environments. And DeepMind came into this space and said, well, we've got deep learning, we've got reinforcement learning, we put the two together, we put a neural network in the agent, and we do a lot of work on the algorithms to make them stable and make them work um, if, if what you're training is a deep neural network. Um, and, and, and this has worked very well and uh, given us a powerful set of tools. Um, and the nice thing about these tools is that they're quite general. So all of these uh, 10 different Atari games were all trained using exactly the same neural network um, with the same uh, initial weights, the same, actually, this, these were all trained together. This is one multitask network that's playing all of these 10 different games. Um, so it's using the same hyperparameters, the same learning rate, um, same learning algorithm, et cetera. It's one general algorithm to play a lot of very different games. Um, and the output, so the input here would be the pixels of the, uh, the, 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 the pixels of the video frames. And the output is 18 possible actions on the joystick for the Atari emulator. Now the nice thing is that that also works for simple robotics tasks. So this is a robotics task where we've got a simulated uh, Jayco arm with three fingers and the task here is simply to reach towards that red ball wherever it appears, and you get a point if you get close enough to it. Uh, and you can be sort of in a range around it, which is why you end up learning sort of a jittery policy. But the cool thing here is that this is trained using exactly the same approach as the previous, as the Atari games. Uh, the only difference here is that now the output, instead of being the actions possible on an Atari, uh, with an Atari joystick, now we have uh, the uh, desired joint velocity for each of the joints of the robot, um, the six, uh, six joints plus the three fingers. So that's, that's great. That, that lets us know that we can do simple tasks using exactly the same formulation. The problem, though, there's still, there's still a lot of problems. So, so the rest of this talk, I'm going to go through three uh, of what I think are the, the, the biggest challenges that we have of going from these um, simple but general approaches to much bigger problems. And I'll, I'll give a challenge and give sort of one approach that I think could help in this area. Um, so the first one is data efficiency. And this actually is maybe the whole thing. It's all about data efficiency. Uh, because uh, really, when you're in the real world then, and, and you're dealing with live data, live interactive data, then that's always going to be expensive. There's always going to be a cost associated with that. And for instance, this, uh, this lovely robot arm, this lovely little simple task, uh, took about 20 hours to train um, on a compute cluster, but that was an asynchronous, multi-threaded algorithm. So there was actually 32 different uh, agents training at the same time. We were sweeping over a bunch of hyperparameters at the same time, and the simulator was capable of running much faster than reality. So if we'd actually done, trained this task, this policy, on the real Jayco arm that we have in the lab, then even if we let it train 24 hours, uh, you know, 24 seven without stopping, it would take 55 days to get to a robust reaching that could start anywhere and reach to any position. Um, 55 days is a long time to let a robot uh, learn how to reach. 
So data efficiency. Yeah, data efficiency is a big one. Um, if you are exploring the world using um, uh, sparse rewards and, um, and, and, and raw pixels, then it can take a very, very long time for learning to get off the ground. So one of the things that we've been looking at at DeepMind is ways of speeding this up. Um, and the, the one I'm going to talk about involves learning from multiple senses, um, or, or more generally, learning from multiple different constraints, multiple different objectives. Um, so what do I mean by that? Uh, let, me, let me talk about this paper here. The authors, it's, we've got a nice long author list uh, we always do at, at DeepMind. Um, this is a paper called Learning to Navigate in Complex Environments. Um, and the, this is what the, the game, the task looks like in a nutshell. Uh, so we have a maze. This is a top-down view of the maze that the agent sees, but it never sees this view of it. It only sees this view of it. So it's a, like it's a rat running around in, in a maze. Um, and it's trying to get to this target here. Do I have, I don't have a pointer on there. Uh, the little orange uh, goal that's there in the maze in the second frame. And if it gets to that goal, then it will immediately get 10 points and respawn somewhere else. And so the, the whole task is to uh, appear somewhere in the maze, figure out where you are, find the goal, then you end up somewhere else, find your way back to the goal again and again and again for a fixed number of frames. Um, and so you keep on, uh, and, 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 and there's different ways in which we can set this up. We can have the maze have a different topology every time, or we can have it be fixed. Um, we can have the goal change location, so on every episode it's in a new place. You have to find it and then refind it again. And this is a hard task because the rewards are sparse. Oh, there's also apples. Those are worth one. They're sort of sprinkled around. Um, and this is a hard task, and what we see is that the, uh, when we train an agent, even a state-of-the-art uh, learning algorithm on this, then it takes a very, very long time to get up to a reasonable level of performance. Um, and in fact, it never really gets up to a human level of performance, which is what the bar we usually uh, set. So what can we do here? Uh, the, the, the approach that we came up with was to take a, take a fairly standard approach that we use, which is a convolutional neural network, first to uh, process the input video, the input um, RGB, and then we add a recurrent layer, actually a two, uh, two recurrent neural network layers, um, both LSTM layers, and then we add uh, auxiliary tasks. And the point is here is that it's very hard to learn from the, uh, from the reward signal alone um, that's the uh, policy and the value outputs here of, of, this, of this cartoon network. So we add these additional tasks. It's like saying to the learning algorithm, you need to find your way to the goal, and you're going to get points for doing that. And eventually, you need to learn how to maximize that reward. But you also should be thinking about how to make sense of, um, uh, of, of what you see and what you have uh, learned in every trajectory around this maze. So the additional tasks that we add, one is to predict the depth of every frame. So it's as if I had two sensory inputs. One gives me RGB information, and the other one gives me, gives me depth information, like a, a LiDAR signal or a, a depth camera um, or connect information, that, that sort of thing. And I want to take that RGB, and I want to predict what the depth is, um, how far away things are. And this is a way of teaching the agent about the geometry of a scene. Um, we also can add uh, loop closure prediction, uh, which would be in this sort of a maze, um, answering the binary question, binary prediction of have I ever been at this, at this location before in this episode? Uh, am I going in circles? Always a good thing to know if you're trying to navigate. So how, does, how well does this work? Um, so this is, I'm just going to show you a comparison of some of the different learning curves. Uh, across the uh, y-axis, we have average reward, mean reward, uh, over a set of episodes. Um, and over, and a, a, sorry, across the y-axis, and across the x-axis is the number, is the length of the, the learning process. Um, so yes, 100 million frames seen. 
terms of learning. And so we see that this is the initial agent that we trained, and this is the average performance over the top five different um, hyperparameters, top five different seeds that we tried. And this is just a feed-forward agent. So this is taking that architecture and saying, I'm just going to train um, a convolutional neural network with a fully connected layer. And as you can see, it doesn't really get up to um, very high. It gets up to maybe almost 100 points on average per episode. And it has this very slow learning curve. Uh, now the next agent that we compare is if we add the LSTM. So now we've added the memory layer to this, uh, a recurrent neural network memory layer, and we see what we often see when we add in an LSTM, which is that you get to eventually a higher performance, but it's a little bit harder to take off, and you get this sort of inflection point where you start to finally learn, uh, where the agent starts to learn. Uh, so that's an improvement, and we know we need memory for this task, so that's an important thing to add. Uh, the next agent, is if we add actually that stacked LSTM. I said that we had two LSTM layers, had some additional inputs. If we add that, we do do better, but the, the learning is not terribly stable. And these, uh, these learning curves are quite uh, smoothed already. Um, now if we add that first auxiliary task, so we're supporting the learning now by saying it's an RL task plus this other supervised task, we see a much earlier takeoff in the learning rate happen. But overall, it's a, more, uh, it's a little bit unstable still. Um, but we do get to a higher point and also have an earlier takeoff in learning. That's adding that loop closure prediction. If we add the depth prediction, we see something much different. Now we see very stable learning happening, and we see that it improves very quickly, uh, very rapidly, right after the agent first, uh, first starts to explore this task, first starts to train on this, then we see an immediate takeoff. The interesting thing here is to compare this to if, if the depth channel information is so important to the agent, why don't we just give it to it as an input? And we tried that. I don't have that in, the, in this slide deck. But if you feed the uh, depth information as an input, as an observation to the agent, it doesn't actually help. It helps a little bit, but still the takeoff is somewhere here as opposed to here. Uh, so we can try, uh, there's two different depth prediction auxiliary losses that we tried. Um, one is on the LSTM and one is on the ConvNet. They both do well. The D2 is on the, the uh, LSTM. That does very well. And then we can add them all together, uh, which actually takes off a little bit earlier but doesn't do quite as well asymptotically. Um, and we can compare this to the human expert. And so actually all of these with auxiliary losses eventually uh, exceed what our human expert can do on this task. So this is a, a, a really big advantage in terms of data efficiency, and that's why I, wanted, I, I mentioned it here, um, although this, this uh, research was a little bit more about navigation. But this is obviously very important to us. And the idea here is that um, when you're training a neural network, if you have noisy gradients from a sparse reward, you need to also have something that's stable. Um, and, and this helps to simply uh, uh, drive the predictive capacity of the whole network um, and stabilize the learning. So adding this other auxiliary task really helps the entire learning process, including on those sparse rewards, which is the only thing that we're actually measuring uh, here is how well we do on those uh, at maximizing the reward. Right. Oh, and here is a, a video of um, the trained agent. So first, this is in a maze that is static. So on every episode, the, it's a big maze, but the, uh, where the walls are is fixed. We change how the pattern on the walls look and the different um, things here, but we, um, you can see the agent zooming through, and this shows the depth prediction. So this is actually, it's not even a very f uh, uh, fine resolution. It's a very coarse um, um, signal here that's being predicted by the agent. Uh, but you can see that, it's, that it gives some notion of the geometry of the space. Here's the agent moving through the maze, and it's actually trying to predict over time exactly where it is. Um, and in some places, it can do a very good job of predicting its location. Uh, in some areas, it's not as sure. Uh, if, for instance, if it gets into a corner or right after it respawns. All right, so on to the next challenge. Um, 
The next thing I'm going to talk about is problem complexity. And one solution here is hierarchical reinforcement learning. So I'm going to talk about something called feudal nets. Uh, that's a recent paper at ICML by some folks at, at DeepMind as well. So let's talk about, I know I said that Atari games were, were too uh, simple, um, to, th that wasn't what we wanted to solve, but we do want to solve Montezuma's Revenge. So Montezuma's Revenge is, is awful. When I got to, uh, when I first started at DeepMind, then people were just saying, oh, you know, this is, the, this is the worst thing ever and we shouldn't even try to do research with Montezuma's Revenge because it's, it's hopeless. Um, so why is it so hopeless? Uh, so basically the reward signal is not just sparse, it's, it's really, really delayed. So when um, you have to jump around in this environment and the very first reward that you get is when you get the key over here. And to do that, you have to come around here and swing on this and avoid the, uh, the skull. And you're not going to get there by random actions. You're not going to get there by, um, by, by just random exploration. Um, and even if you do manage to get there, it becomes pretty meaningless. So it's very hard for the network to, to generalize. It's very hard to get cons meaningful exploration. Um, uh, so it would, and that's all because we're operating in this space of simple, very primitive actions. If we could instead make the decision of, I'm going to try swinging on that rope, or I'm going to try climbing that ladder and see what happens. But that's not what, what we do. We usually just decide, I'm going to go one space up or one space down, which doesn't tell us much. So that's why Montezuma's revenge is very hard. Um, so, and what we would like is a system where we have perhaps sub-goals, where we can break up the problem and learn some sub-policies to achieve them. And instead of, instead of uh, uh, exploring over primitive actions, we could explore over the possible sub-goals. Um, uh, but this is a bit of a problem, because how do we decide where the sub-goals are? Of course, we could come in as a human and say, climbing the ladder is a sub-goal, swinging on the rope is a sub-goal, but that, that's not in the spirit of end-to-end -end learning. We, uh, you know, cannot, uh, we don't want to give that sort of top-down information to the agent. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem there to doing the learning. Um, of how do you learn the sub-goals if you can't get anywhere in the game to begin with? Um, so HRL, or hierarchical reinforcement learning, has been around for quite a while um, as being, uh, and, and the promise here is that if you have HRL, then you can do long-term credit assignment. So you would be able to say, ah, I did this back here, and now hundreds of steps later, I died, and I'm going to do the accurate credit assignment. That's really hard to do otherwise. But if I'm thinking about my policy over this long-term um, temporal span, then I can start to, to do that long-term credit assignment and memory. Um, I could also do structured exploration, as I said, and this will lead to better generalization, better exploration, uh, and also transfer learning. Right? So if I learn the, a particular set of sub-goals in one part of the game, they'll probably apply to a different part of the game or even to a different game altogether. Uh, so that's the promise of HRL, uh, but, but th there have been very few approaches that have really managed to do this. Um, there was a paper from 93 by Peter Diane and Jeff Hinton, so you know if, 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 if they're authoring something uh, 93, we should probably all be uh, taking a close look at it now, uh, which is what Sasha and uh, his colleagues did. Um, so the idea here be behind feudal nets um, is similar to the the paradigm of a convolutional neural network. You want to have layers um, where you have levels of uh, where you have levels of ab abstraction, um, and where the but in this case the temporal resolution changes as opposed to in a conv net where the spatial re resolution changes or the the field of view. Um, it's a way of saying that uh, my policy should be decomposable into more primitive parts and higher level parts that are, that are more abstract. And we need to be able to learn these different layers automatically. That's, that's the tricky part. Um, and of course, we'd like to do this with neural networks, which is something that although uh, Peter and Jeff uh, coined the term feudal RL, uh, they didn't have a means for making this work with neural networks. And that's what we've been working on. So uh, at a high level, this is feudal nets, uh, which we call FUN. Uh, that's what the name of the paper is. And the idea is first there is a conv net, 
Right, so that's going to e extract uh, our visual features from the input image. And then we're going to have two different networks here, almost entirely decomposed. One is going to be the manager. The manager is going to operate at a low temporal resolution, and its job is to produce goals. And the goals are in the form of just the latent space, latent representation, so a set of, of features. And those goals will be generated and sent to the other network, which you can think of as the worker. The worker receives the sub-goal and chooses an action, so has a, a policy, chooses an action and uh, executes that. And the worker is trying to do two things. It's both trying to, uh, uh, so it is trained to match the sub-goal. So if the sub-goal says, uh, get to the ladder, then it's going to try to get to a, a, a latent representation that is as similar as possible. Uh, using cosine distance. And it's going to also be trying to maximize reward in the environment, uh, which is different from the original feudal RL. And the manager is trained uh, using a different policy gradient. It, it assumes that the worker is going to succeed. It assumes that the worker is going to try in good faith to get to the goal uh, that, that the manager sends to the worker. And so given that assumption of that it's going to try to get to the, the sub-goal, um, then that frees the manager to optimize at this higher temporal level, at this higher level of planning. There's, of course, this is, this is feudal nets at a high level. There's a low level is a lot messier. My husband looked at this and said, you're missing the ground connection. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to go through this. I'm going to say, take a look at the paper. It's on archive if you want to know all of the details. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff in this paper, actually. Um, but the, the, the question for us is, does it work? Um, and the answer is that it does. So uh, on the right here, we have uh, the training curve. And this shows what happens if you have an agent that just has an LSTM, uh, which theoretically could manage to do the same sorts of things, but it really just doesn't manage in the exploration space to get, to get off the ground um, very far. These two red lines indicate the first red line is getting the key, is the points you get from getting the key. Uh, on that first screen, and the second red line is the points that you get when you move to the second screen. So this is the first two, this is where you need to get to before you can really start to do any learning in this game. So the green curve manages to get to that second screen, but doesn't get much further, even with a lot of experience, whereas the feudal network's uh, agent uh, managing, manages to get up to, uh, to almost 2,000 points, uh, which is nowhere near as good as a human expert. <laughs> but is a lot better than what we had before. And we can do a little bit of analysis as to what's happening. Um, this looks at a correlation of getting to these sub-goals. So these are, these are things that the uh, after training, that the manager thinks that these are useful sub-goals and, and the worker knows how to get to them. So the correlation of those two things. And what we see is that we see a spike um, when for the, um, well, if the first one is the start location. The second one is hopping over that first little uh, barrier there. The third one is climbing down the ladder. Um, the fourth one is, uh, I don't know, jumping over the skull that's there maybe, and then getting to the key. Which are all, those are, uh, those are approximately the sort of sub-goals that, that a human, I think, would, would also define. So it's nice that it converges to something that's sensible. And this is the actual policy that's been learned. It always dumps one life to get the, rid of the skull. Always. And it always dumps one life doing that. But it manages to get to the second screen with lives to spare, can go down the ladder, has to get the sword here, come back up the ladder, and then, yay, kill one of the skulls and get killed by the other. And that's about it. That's, <laughs> that's 2,500 points. Um, but uh, I, can, I can tell you there was a lot of excitement in the office when this video got <laughs> sent around. <laughs> um, so it's, it's good to see. Of course, there's a lot of, I think, other interesting ways. When, when we play the game, you know, if my 10-year-old was to play Montezuma's Revenge, I think that he would realize pretty quickly that skulls are bad and keys are good, swords are good. 
Um, there's a lot of semantics that we bring to a game like this, which is the other reason why it's, why it's so hard. Um, and I think that there's a lot of interesting work to be done in, uh, you know, what if I could learn about keys? What if I can learn about skulls? What if I can learn these things and transfer them to this game? Then I think we would also see a big speed up in performance. Um, but uh, I think those, those sorts of learning al algorithms can be very tricky to make them general as opposed to something that's specifically uh, for Montezuma's Revenge. The nice thing about feudal nets is that they don't just work on Montezuma's Revenge. They actually work better uh, and get faster learning performance on most of the, the Atari games and on a whole set of memory games and other tasks. Uh, so, and those results are in the paper. All right, so the last in my seven seconds that I have last, left. Um, I just want to talk quickly about one other um, challenge and method, and this is continuous control. So the idea here is that, um, you know, we haven't talked about how do you control an actual articulated body? How do you control muscles? How do you choose, um, uh, how do you cho choose continuous values as actions? And this is something that's quite hard, and it's quite hard to include into a learning algorithm. Um, one thing, one approach that I think is really nice has come out uh, fairly recently uh, from a group led by Nicholas at DeepMind, and this is on transfer and reuse of locomotor control. And the basic idea here is that we're going to separate the types of observations that we make into proprioceptive and exteroceptive. So proprioceptive observations are observations about things that are close to oneself. Meaning in this case, um, how do the, uh, the, the joint angles um, of a body, the velocities, and maybe the tactile information that's coming in. These are all uh, uh, things that a baby learns um, immediately or is born with some knowledge of. Then there's extraceptive observations. So these would be things that are far away from the body that are about the goal, that are about what we are trying to do and about long range perceptions. So vision, um, but also information about where is the goal and what am I trying to do. And this, the, the, this, the intuition behind this research is that we want to separate the learning of these two. We want to learn how to, have, uh, uh, how to interpret proprioceptive information without having any goal. Then we want to learn how to transfer that. It's how do I move my body and then how do I move my body to satisfy uh, some external goal that's been given to me. Um, and this is what the approach looks like in um, a slightly odd form. The idea is that we're going to separate proprioceptive and exteroceptive uh, different types of observations. And we're going to separately learn a low-level controller and a high-level controller that's going to look at these different things separately. Um, and the high-level controller can both see uh, the goal information, like where am I trying to get to or what am I trying to do, and can also see what the low-level controller is doing. Low-level low controller just tries to move the, uh, the, the, the body um, of the, the, the robot or whatever in a consistent way, in a meaningful way. And the way in which it's trained is in three phases. First, there's some pre-training of the low-level controller. Think about this as being, again, something that, that a baby might do before it is told to do anything, before it's trying to accomplish any goal. It's just trying to figure out what happens when it moves its arms around. Then we give it, um, we use IAD Gaussian noise to feed in, and this gives us exploration, but simply using noise. And then finally, we train the high-level controller uh, to actually solve a specific task. And the advantage of this is that it really gives very, very fast learning. Again, in the end, it's all about data efficiency in some ways, but this is amazing to see that if we just try to train some of these networks from scratch, we get very flat or very poor performance, and the green curve at the top is if we use this, this process here of first training the body, then training the task. First the proprioceptive, then the exteroceptive. And this is the last video I have, and this shows on a few different types of um, simulated critters, um, what, what happens here. So here the, the first, the, I, I'm behind. The snake is now being uh, taught, this is a six uh, dimensional snake, and it's just trying to get to the target. And you saw that first it sort of moved, learned to move, then it was given this external goal information and it could then learn very quickly. Uh, same thing, here's a 
canyon traversal task when it, if it's just trying to get through here. All right, so the second uh, critter is a quadruped. We call this the ant, although it does not have enough legs. And uh, so again, it's the same process with the last part of it being seeking a new task. And we can learn multiple different transfer tasks, multiple different high-level tasks, while keeping that same efficient, good, low-level controller. So this is uh, an ant playing soccer. Well, an ant making goals. And this learning is impossible if you start from scratch. But if you start by learning the body and then learning the task, then it suddenly becomes feasible. And that's what we, that's what we need to uh, be doing. There's one more, um, one more example, that humanoid, which I think is 23 DOFs, um, degrees of freedom. So first, it, this looks awful, sort of, we're torturing this poor thing. <laughs> there, is, there is a rhyme and a reason to it, though. Um, we can make this look a lot more realistic, but really it's not. It's saying we know nothing about this body. We know nothing about it. But now we're going to manage to teach it how to, with a set of high-level controllers, how to get, how to run in a consistent way and how to avoid these big obstacles by sort of slaloming around it. And you know, this is how we sort of start out. We flail around a lot. We do a lot of ridiculous things. We fall down in lots of ridiculous ways. But then we get to a point where we understand how to use um, the different joints and angles and muscles that we have so that we can do any task that's set before us. Um, and I think that in any way possible, this is the reinforcement learning. We end up with something that uh, can be a little bit odd looking. But um, I think that, this, that, that all of these uh, three approaches are going to help us towards taking DeepRL and all of its potential towards a, well, uh, a lot of very interesting real world problems, real world tasks. Um, so I'd encourage you to check out some of these different papers, look at them in more detail. Um, and uh, see what comes uh, from DeepMind next. It's always fun. Anyway, thank you.